as I talk to you today, um, what I'm going to try to convince you of is that relationships are really integral to development and that they're really a part of teenage development and that um, they're not separate from it. And so I'm really going to try to talk about the importance of relationships. So really quickly, um, a number of acknowledgments of people who have worked on the various studies that I'm going to talk to you about today, um, both colleagues of mine at the University of Virginia and some folks who I know you've had here to speak, Bart Hirsch and David Dubois, um, and some different foundations and sources who have funded some of the work I'm going to be talking about. So to give you a quick overview of uh, my talk today, I'm going to be focusing on research I've done in after-school programs, and I'm going to think about, I'm going to talk about them as, as sort of developmental settings. So there's been a lot of research on after-school programs really thinking about outcomes, right? So do kids do better in school if they go to after-school programs? Do they reduce their risky behavior? I try to think about after-school programs more broadly and think about youth holistically within them. Um, and particularly, I'm interested in adolescent identity, so that will come up in my talk. And I'm going to focus mostly on the role of relationships and relationships with adult staff, also some um, thoughts on relationships between youth. I'm going to do that by presenting the broad findings from four related studies of after-school programs and how they contribute to our thinking about the role of relationships. And then I'm going to present the case study of one particular youth who I call Lorenzo. All the various names that I use in this talk are pseudonyms for kids that they picked out themselves. Um, because Lorenzo's story sort of encapsulates a lot of the main themes that I am going to try to hit home today. I'll give you a brief overview of some of the current work I'm doing on the Young Women Leaders Program, just so you can sort of see how this thinking has informed where I'm going. And then I'm going to talk about um, conclusions, and I'm really going to try to do some sort of implications for practice and think about what is it that uh, the research I've done, how can that help inform what people actually do in the context of youth programs. Okay, so before launching into um, the various studies, I want to give you a really brief um, sort of background, set the stage by explaining how I think about, since I'm talking about development and identity, I want to just let you know where I'm coming from. And so when I talk about development, um, I think about human development as a cultural process. Uh, and this is a quote from a woman named Barbara Rogoff, whose, whose work I draw on. Um, hum as a biological species, humans are defined in terms of our cultural participation. And that's important to know because when I study youth development, I'm studying how they participate in after-school programs. And I think that that really contributes to their development. So, um, and then Yuri Bronfenbrenner, who is someone who's been very influential in the field of human development in thinking about, again, how people develop, how humans develop. It. And that's sort of a... a rough map of his theory. So the person you can see there is, this, is in the center. And all of us develop in these layered contexts. So what's listed there as the microsystem would be something like an after-school program, or your family, or your school classroom. And then there are lots of settings that we're not directly in, but that influence us. So I really try to think about how the immediate environments of our lives influence us across time. So and then the other construct that I talk about a lot is identity, and so I wanted to give you a brief summary of how I define identity. There are a number of definitions up there from various thinkers in the field, um, but the, the sort of take-home point for me is that identity is something that we carry in our heads, that it is an internal concept, but it's constructed in the context of relationships with other people. So it is a psychosocial system. And this is why relationships are particularly important to me as I think about teenagers and how they develop a sense of identity. Okay. And in adolescence, identity is particularly important. Teenagers are really starting to think about their identity and who they are um, because of their developmental, their cognitive abilities are increasing and their social worlds are expanding. So this is one of the reasons that in thinking about how teenagers participate in after-school programs, I think a lot about how they're constructing their identity. 
Okay, so I know I don't need to convince you, as I said, that after school programs are important spaces in youth's lives, but I do want to give you a little brief overview of the work that it has informed my work. Um, there's been a lot of increasing research and policy attention on after school programs in recent years. Um, they've been talked about as a means of a supportive context for youth, particularly youth who are living in neighborhoods that may have fewer resources to support them. Um, they've also sometimes seen as a, mean of a means of addressing what's called the 3 to 6 p.m. risk. Those are the hours that youth are most likely to be unsupervised and to engage in risky activity. So after school programs have been talked about as a way to help reduce that risk. There's a large body of research that's suggesting that after school programs do promote personal, behavioral, and academic competencies. Um, but there's also increased interest in what I mentioned is this broad developmental potential of after-school programs. So it's not just about producing certain positive outcomes, but it's about supporting youth in a more holistic manner. But there's still a need for a lot, of, a lot more work on understanding what happens within the organizations that help promote positive outcomes. Um, I believe that part of the story, and in fact, possibly a large part of it, is about the relationships that youth build in these after-school programs. So adult youth relationships are increasingly being seen as being important to after-school program success. And there are more and more people who are really citing this as key to what happens that, that makes good programs work. So I'm going to try to convince you that in addition to the adult youth relationships, youth-youth relationships are also very important and can play a really important role. Um, so we know that adolescents need support of adults, but we also know that the relationships with adults need to be really matched to their particular needs and have to help support them in particular ways. Um, and we also know that after-school programs are oftentimes successful in reaching and supporting kids who may be struggling in other contexts of their lives and may, for example, not be doing well in school but are really engaged with and doing well in an after-school program. And that also suggests to me that staff in after-school programs know how to reach kids in a way that maybe other adults in their lives don't. And so I think we have a lot to learn from after-school program staff about how to successfully work with youth. So, positive adult youth relationships, I believe, can contribute to after school programs in two main ways. They help create a positive climate, an overall climate to which youth want to come, right? And we know an after school program can't have positive outcomes if the youth aren't attending it. So, on a very basic level, I think the adult staff help create that environment that youth want to engage in. But I think they also serve as a building block for positive development, and that really effective staff know how to use their relationships with youth to really engage youth in the programs and curriculum of after-school programs. And of course, they also serve as role models, and they can serve as role models um, in sort of modeling for youth future possible selves for themselves. Um, I'm also going to talk in part about authority in adult youth relationships, which is something that's not talked about as much, um, but that came out in one of the studies I did, and I'm going to talk about how I think that staff people um, can use their relationships with youth to have positive authority relationships, um, and that's something that seemed to be a theme in after-school programs, that kids had much more positive relationships with adult authority in their after-school settings than they were having in, in some of their schools. Okay, so again, I'm going to sort of start from the premise that staff-youth relationships are really the backbone of after-school programs and that it's a critical component that can enhance or detract from their efforts. But I'm also going to really then talk about how in addition to that, youth-youth, and particularly older youth relationships with younger youth, can really then be, uh, po promote positive development and provide really positive developmental opportunities to teenagers. And I also want to say that I think that after-school programs are really a unique setting because there aren't that many settings in kids' lives where there are, they are exposed to multiple ages. So they have adults to role model for them, and they also have younger kids who they might serve as role models for, and that's something I'm going to talk more about as we progress through. So I think that after-school programs pose a real unique opportunity of settings for relational building for youth. So Dale actually mentioned, he set me up well here, he mentioned the black box idea. Um, the National Research Council, some of you may be familiar with their 2002 report, 
That said that youth organizations provide positive support for youth um, and might be especially important in filling the gaps in the settings of youth who are growing up in uh, neighborhoods with fewer resources. But they also no noted that the organizations tend to work like a black box. So we know youth go in, some youth come out doing better than when they went in. They have positive academic outcomes, positive social outcomes, but we're not really clear always on how we get from here to there, on what do we actually do inside these programs that contributes to the positive um, outcomes. And so a lot of research has focused on the outcomes, and as I said, more and more research is now focusing on what happens inside that black box, and that's where I really focus. So I really think that how what happens inside the black box, the reason it works is because it's doing particular things that are aligned with adolescents' developmental needs, right? So teenagers are at a particular point in their lives where they need certain things individually. And some of those things that I think after school programs do, by the nature of the activities and relationships that occur within them, are meet the needs for teenagers to integrate roles across their lives, to have a sense of individual validation to feel a sense of belonging, and also to have the sense of balance between autonomy and support. So as all of you who work with teenagers know, they are striving for autonomy, right? They're trying to, they're sort of pushing those boundaries to be individualistic, but they're also in need of adult support. And so I think that successful after school programs really help provide both of those things. So I'm going to sort of show you today as we walk through these studies how I think that the relationships in particular that youth cultivated after school programs help adolescents accomplish these developmental tasks. So I'm going to do this by talking about four related studies and I'm just going to sort of go through the findings of, of each of these fairly briefly highlighting the, the key points that um, relate to each other. The first is I'm gonna talk a bit of, about the club is home and I know that you've had Bart Hirsch here so I'm not gonna go into depth about that. Um, I'm then gonna talk about identity development. This is based on the work in my book, particularly thinking about how youth develop a sense of self that is in relation to other people and connected to other people. And I'm gonna talk about what I've come to term tri-level role modeling, which is this idea of older teens being role models for younger kids. I'm then gonna talk about adult youth relationships and the organizational practices of after school programs. And then finally about adult youth relationships within the context of authority and respect. So the overarching argument I'm gonna make again is this idea that the relationships play an important developmental role in our lives. And this is supported by some developmental theory that really suggests that relatedness is a basic developmental need of all human beings. Okay. So I'm going to start with um, a brief summary of some work that I did. And so any of the names that are up in parentheses, these are sort of collaborators who I collaborated with on a particular study. So. I collaborated with Bart Hirsch on this project. Um, it was part of a larger gender equity evaluation for a regional branch of the Boys and Girls Clubs of America. And we were really looking, um, in this particular part of the study, we looked at the, the Boys and Girls Club as a home place for youth. And this work was spurred by the fact that I was one of the researchers, the field researchers in this project, and was out in the clubs, hanging out, doing observations, talking to kids, talking to staff. And I noticed that kids and staff were both using the language of home and family. And this might be a dumb moment for people who spend a lot of time in these organizations. But what occurred to me was that this was pretty important because the language of home and family, that suggests a certain kind of attachment and meaning. Um, and so I wanted to really better understand this. So we had a survey sample of about 300 youth, and then we had an interview sample of about 112 youth across four different um, boys and girls clubs in urban neighborhoods. So 74% of the youth we interviewed said that the club was a home to them. So that's pretty striking. Three quarters of the kids said that they felt like the Boys and Girls Club was a home to them. So 
I then followed up and probed them about, well, why is the club as a home? And listened to what they told me. So what, what are the reasons? And I divided their answers. When I sort of looked at what they said, I divided their answers into what I called sort of psychosocial answers, which meant that they were talking about things like feeling cared about or receiving support. It was some kind of an emotional feeling. And then physical answers, which were things like, well, it's clean or it's better than being on the street, right? It's physically a safe environment. Um, and 73% of the kids gave at least one psychosocial reason, whereas only 13% of the kids gave a physical reason. So really it was about the emotional attachment, right, to the Boys and Girls Club. And the majority of the responses, in fact, 66% of the responses, referred to the relationships that kids had at the Boys and Girls Club, and particularly their relationships with adult staff. So there were no significant differences between boys and girls on this, or between um, youth of different ages or races or ethnicities. So this was really a broad-based phenomenon. And that's also particularly important because it's been suggested that relationships are more important to girls' development than to boys. But in fact, both boys and girls at these sites were really talking about the relationships as being important to them. So this pushed me to really think more about the important role of relationships in development, in, in identity and self-development, but also in making after-school programs a supportive place for youth. So the second study, um, I really wanted to focus on teenagers' actual activity in after-school programs and look at that as a, as a way to think about how they're exploring a sense of self, how they're starting to think about themselves as developing adults. So this work was conducted in what I call the East Side Boys and Girls Club. It is a club that's located near a housing project in an urban center in the Midwest. Um, the majority of youth who attend the center did live in the housing project that was nearby. So the club, at the time I started the research, I spent about four years there doing field work and hanging out with the kids and the staff. And over the time I was there, it started out a predominantly African-American club. It became a little more ethnically mixed by the end of my time there, but was still majority African-American with a mixture of Hispanic and white youth. Um, as I think most of you already know sort of what boys and girls clubs do, so you know what the atmosphere there is like, I assume, so I'm not gonna go sort of into that. Um, but I will say that this particular club, I spent time in a number of different clubs in this same city, and this was one that was particularly well-functioning. It was a club that um, had a really involved, invested director and seemed to really sustain active youth participation. So officially, kids between the ages of 6 and 12 had to leave the club between 6 and 7 p.m., but in fact, this club was one where they really tended to sort of bend the rules to meet kids' needs. So if there were younger kids who had to stay later, they let that happen. And they also had older teenagers who would come in the afternoon and work with the younger kids, and that's something that came out as important. So as I said, I did about four years of observations and field works in the club. Um, I did, conducted focus groups with kids, I did interviews with a subsample of youth, I interviewed 17 youth total, I interviewed them twice, and I actually did photography projects with those 17 youth where I gave them disposable cameras and they went out and took photos and then we talked about the photos in one of the interviews. All right, so all of the kids that I talked to were active club members or had been coming to the club for a long time, even if their participation had dropped off. And that was purposeful, because I really wanted to understand, for kids who really did get invested in the club, what was it and how did it affect them? So what I learned was that their participation in the club really influenced their self-perceptions. It influenced how they thought about themselves and that the relationships with other people again, supporting what I heard before, were really important to both boys and girls. So in my interviews, I would ask kids to describe themselves. And when I did that in an open-ended way, and I just said, describe yourself to me. And then I went in and looked at what they said. 24% of the kids who I interviewed set, used the word respectful in their answers, and 23% used the word responsible. And then I asked them to describe themselves in another way. I said, give me the five words that you think best describe you. And when I did that, 35% of the kids used the word respectful. And 59% used some kinds of words like nice, 
helpful, caring, responsible. I did not give the kids a word list. This was completely spontaneously generated by them. And so this word respect really struck me. I mean, it was in more than a third of their answers. And so I started to really look at this. Um, there were no gender differences in their responses. Both boys and girls used these kinds of words, which I consider connected words, right? These are words that sort of define how we are in relationship to other people, right? We're respectful, we're nice, we're helpful. And both boys and girls were really using these words in their self-descriptions. Um, in addition, 65% of the youth said they would not be who they are today without the Boys and Girls Club. So that, that was pretty striking. And when I asked them, well, tell me about that. So you say you wouldn't be who you are today. How would you be different? And many of them talked about, well, how they developed respect. They had developed a sense of maturity and responsibility through participating at the Boys and Girls Club. So they really saw themselves. They considered these particular traits important to who they are. And they saw themselves as having developed those traits at the Boys and Girls Club. So I wanted to just give you a few examples of when I asked kids for their self-descriptions, the kinds of things they said. So these are some quotes from some of the kids I talked to. Um, again, both boys and girls blended characteristics like intelligence and humor, things we might think about as being sort of more individual characteristics with these ideas of respectfulness and kindness, these real relatedness terms. Um, and staffs with relationships with youth, as I watched them, and talked to staff, talked to youth, and observed them, both modeled and supported the kinds of respect and responsibility that were described by youth as being important to them. So you can see Kelly's quote here. He says, um, responsible is my most important trait because I feel people can trust me. They know if they need something from me, if there's a way in any my power I can do it, I'll do it. Being responsible is appreciated at the Boys and Girls Club because the staff know if one of their bosses from downtown come, I'm going to come and ask the questions that need to be answered. I ain't going to act the fool in front of them. The staff know that I know there's a time to be serious. And as Kelly indicated, staff did expect youth to be responsible and respectful. But what was really unique, and when I talked to youth also about how this was different from other places in their lives, there was this idea of a bi-directional respect. So it wasn't just that staff expected them to be respectful and responsible, but they felt they knew that staff respected them as people. And therefore, they would act respectful and responsible because they were getting it back. Right. So I want to show you an example of how I saw this done. Um, this is from my field notes. This is an observation I did of a staff person um, named Cheryl. Cheryl ran some, a bunch of girls programs at this Boys and Girls Club. And she was just a, a really well-loved staff person. Um, the girls in particular really loved Cheryl. In fact, Cheryl once said to me, you know, it doesn't matter what I could do with them. We could be sitting in this room throwing a rock around the room. It's not what we're doing. It's the fact that they get to be here with me and with each other, hanging out and talking. But I think Cheryl was actually underestimating her own power and expertise as a staff person. I mean, she really did know how to balance a real respectful relationship with youth with encouraging responsibility. So this is um, an interaction between her and the cheerleading team that she coached. So Cheryl begins to ask the girls what happened on Saturday. Apparently, they're supposed to perform, and only a few of them showed up. Cheryl talks firmly to them, saying, just because I am not there doesn't mean you can just not show up. You treat them just like you treat me. That hurt me and embarrassed me that you didn't come. Someday you have to commit to something. She talks about responsibility and how you can't just be a member of the squad when it's fun. You can't just show up for sleepovers and not when it's hard work. Because I know who was here Saturday, and if you think you didn't come Saturday, but you're coming to the, the sleepover, you're wrong. Because I'll be standing out there with a clipboard, and you won't come in. Cheryl explains that once they're in high school, they get kicked off the squad for not showing up for practice or a performance. This isn't for me, you know. I've got mine. You've got to get yours. I know that I'm being hard on you, and you may not come back because you'll be mad at me, but I want you to be responsible. Cheryl will occasionally stop and look at someone. Are you okay, she'll ask with concern in her voice. So she Cheryl really balances her lecture here. She balances this lecture on responsibility with a clear respect for the girls as people, 
So they do have a responsibility to the group and to her, and she emphasizes that. But she really also emphasizes their own responsibility for their own futures, right? Um, and she wasn't the only staff person who really saw it as her responsibility to infuse a sense of personal responsibility in the club members. And staff encouraged respect and responsibility through their expect expectations for youth. There would be special rewards for things. There would be leadership roles where youth had to do things. And again, the staff really provided respect and responsibility for the youth. Um, this idea that I mentioned earlier of tri-level role modeling is a good example of this, but I'm actually going to hold off talking about that until I present the case study of Lorenzo later, because he's really a particularly nice exemplar of that idea. Okay, so in conclusion, um, respect and responsibility were really encouraged and developed at the club. What made the club distinctive as compared to other environments in these youth's lives was the respect that it conferred on the individual youth. This allowed members to see themselves as both unique and talented individuals, so as I mentioned earlier, this idea of individual validation, but it also let them see themselves as responsible members of a community, right? So the sense of belonging. So the, I also noticed that the, these kind of respectful interpersonal selves that were nurtured at the East Side Boys and Girls Club was also in the opposition to the stereotypes that a lot of these kids faced elsewhere in their lives. So they talked about being stereotyped by teachers or by the police or by people on the street. And the, this image of them that the staff at the Boys and Girls Club held up was in opposition to that stereotype. The lack of the gender difference was also particularly notable to me, this idea that these relationships were important to both the boys and the girls. And it, I think it really challenges the way we think about development as being different for boys and girls and really highlights the fact that relationships are important to both boys and girls. Study number three. Um, was a study that I did, again, with Bart Hirsch and David Dubois, who I know you've also had here, so I'll also probably go pretty quickly through this one since you may already have heard a bit about this. Um, this was a project, a mixed methods project, that focused in depth on the adult youth relationships that were developed within after-school programs. We followed um, about 30 youth and seven adults over the course of a year. We followed their dyadic relationships in depth. So we sort of watched staff youth relationships develop over the course of a year to see what happened. Um, overall, we made 233 visits to, a, uh, I think it was three different clubs over the course of that year. And what we found was that it was really about the fit of individual youth with organizational level characteristics that produce positive outcomes. Okay. So I'm going to highlight this through an intensive case study we did of a girl who uh, she called herself Pocahontas. That was the name she chose for herself. Um, she had a very close relationship with a staff person named Manuel. She was also involved in a lot of activities and programs at the club and tended to interact with all of the staff people. Um, she was often seen in the game room playing ping pong, hanging out. Um, but her relationship with Manuel was very striking. This was a girl who had had a lot of loss in her life. Um, both her parents were not in the picture at all. Um, she didn't feel that, that where she was living, the relative she was living with wanted her at all. Um, she was really, I mean, this was a girl who actually periodically would just tear up sitting thinking about her life. So Manuel tutored her in math. He fed her dinner. He walked her home. I mean, he really sort of holistically cared for her over the course of this year. Um, and he walked her home because she had actually been threatened by a kid in the neighborhood. And so he was literally keeping her physically safe. So over the course of this year, the other staff people saw this relationship grow. And they began to also spend more time with Pocahontas. And the other staff noted that Pocahontas was actually doing better. She was interacting better with adults. She seemed more stable emotionally. And I think that the fact that they could see her involvement and see her relationship with Manuel contribute to it really helped um, build a, a community where the other staff also helped to support her. 
There was also a lot of positive momentum that got into place here. So she started to get a lot more involved in other activities. She'd been doing ping pong. She started to take on leadership roles in the Keystone Club, which was a service activity. She started to uh, do a lot of service through the club, through her peer jury group. She sometimes was seen washing the windows. I mean, this is a, a teenage girl. You don't see teenage girls very often. You don't see anybody very often voluntarily washing windows. Um, she would staff the front desk. She would help out staff with younger kids. And eventually, by the end of the year, the staff members had actually taken her into their dinner group. So when the club would close down for, I think it was about half an hour, when the staff ate dinner, the younger kids went home, the staff ate dinner, and then the older kids came, she actually would come both in the afternoon and the evenings. And they started to let her stay in the club with them and just sit there and have meals with them. Um, and it, it was just amazing to watch her sort of become part of this family. So. She had a very public role by the end of the year, and a public role in a way that made the life of the club better for people. And at the end of the year, she showed real improved behavior and improved grades. She was doing better academically, and she was doing better um, socially and emotionally. So what we saw was really that youth, as they developed close relationships with individual uh, staff members, in cases with the best outcomes, cases where this really took off, those relationships were supported by the organizational practices of the club as a whole, right? So that there was support for that relationship from other staff people, from the club directors. There were opportunities for that relationship building. And there were other staff people around who would talk to them about this youth and who also knew what was going on in the youth's lives. And then there were opportunities for the youth to become more integrated into the social fabric of the club, right? She was, there were opportunities for her. I mean, you can imagine if she was at a club where maybe there weren't opportunities for her to work with the younger kids or to take on some other leadership roles. She might not have had the same outcomes. So that these relationships were supported by these other opportunities. And that really produced these positive academic and social outcomes. So what we saw in this study was really how youth, staff, and activities interact over time to make that setting a positive developmental space. And to us, the foundation of it was really the relationships that then allowed for and the, the organizational practices being in place that could then take advantage of those relationships. So the final study I'm gonna talk about before I move to talking about the case study of Lorenzo is a study I did um, with Jeffrey Jones, who was a doctoral student of mine at the University of Virginia, who is now at Western Michigan University. And we decided to replicate and expand the study that I had done um, previously looking at youth's relationships in after-school clubs and the idea of respect that I talked about that came out when kids were really describing themselves as, res um, as being respectful, we decided to really focus a lot more in depth on this idea of respect and really focus in on the youth's relationships with the adult staff and how respect was part of that. So we used the data that I had from before and then we went into the field for a year and collected a year, uh, another year's worth of observations and interviews with youth at another Boys and Girls Club, this time in the Mid-Atlantic, in a small uh, city in the Mid-Atlantic. And we followed with additional questions about this idea of respect and authority and staff relationships. So these are a few uh, quotes from the youth, but some major themes that really emerged around the idea of the adult youth relationships was first that kids really felt there was a difference between their school and club environments, which isn't really a big surprise. The after-school programs in schools have very different structures. But it was their relationships with adults in those spaces that was also very different. And I think that's important for us to think about. There was also this interaction of respect and authority. And the kids really differentiated between respect for rules and respect from people, for people. And it seemed like the most effective staff were really the staff who had that respect for people that they could translate into youth's respect for their authority. They didn't just rely on 
respect, for, uh, respect of authority. They really nurtured relationships with youth and used those relationships to have kids respect their authority. And then we also found that staff used particular strategies, that effective staff used their relationships to engage youth in the clubs. So um, this first quote, CJ, um, the Midtown and Eastside were the two different clubs. Midtown was the club in the Mid-Atlantic and Eastside was the club in the urban Midwest. So CJ said at school, it's like strict discipline. You have to do exactly what they say no matter what you want to do. At the club, it's like you can just play around with the staff and they, they're more like your peers, but you treat them with more respect because they're not your equals. So in fact, she recognizes a difference and she respects staff. And what came out in other places was that the staff respected the youth. Again, that same theme was there and that helped youth respect the staff. Um, Charlene, who said, I have respect for adults. I don't want them to get in trouble if I say something. I have no business saying, so I'll hold my peace till I'm away from them. But if they don't give me respect, then I don't respect them. Right? So again, she differentiates. She might respect somebody's authority in order not to get in trouble, but that doesn't mean she respects the person. And in places where the, I think the staff had the best relationships with youth, both were there. The kids respected the authority and the person. And then Tyler, who was a Midtown staff person, really got it, right? He knows this. So he says, in order for someone to respect your authority, you have to interact with them. That's something. No one's going to respect you because they don't know who you are, where you are, what you do, why you're here. You need to get in depth, get down there with the kids, talk with them on their level. You've got to understand where they're coming from, where, way, the way their parents treat them. You've got to talk to them, right? So he really got it. And that is, that's what we found, that the adults, when kids describe the differences between their relationships with adults in the after-school program versus in school, the staff at after-school programs, they were more likely to say, got this, and they felt respected them. Okay. So again, this was another staff at Midtown who really um, also understood that it was the relationships that made kids come back. So the number one reason kids come back is because of the relationships they built. Both the relationship intertwined with the authority, making sure the kids do what they do, but they're always going to push the boundaries. There's also a relationship. They respect you for the discipline, actually. So that he recognized that the kids needed the discipline and that if you respect the kids, they really respected that authority. And what we saw also in the years worth, I mean, we were in these sites observing and we saw that in action. So respect really did seem to be the base from which these relationships developed. And that the youth responded to the respect that was offered to them by staff. So they were also more re receptive to staff authority. And they were more engaged in the after school program. Um, we also noted that there seemed to be three particular strategies that youth, uh, that, I'm sorry, that staff employed. Um, to really get youth engaged, and they relied on their relationships with kids, which was what was particularly notable. So they did something that we called minimized relational distance. So they would cre create con uh, connections with kids. If you remember the kid, uh, uh, CJ, I think it was, the quote from CJ who said, uh, they're, they're like our peers, but there's more respect. And so the staff knew how to play that up, but they knew how to play it up appropriately, right? So that they would be peers, but they were adult-like peers. There was a clear line. Um, they also did what we saw active inclusion, so they were pretty good at bringing new kids into the fold and, and sort of doing that kind of social peer, peer work with the kids. And one of the unique things about after school programs is that staff people have a lot more access to other relationships in youth lives. So a lot of the kids had siblings or cousins at the club, right? And so they would draw on those relationships to help engage kids who maybe were having trouble. And so the staff really sort of, I, I saw, use these relationships in a really positive way. So we really found that these kinds of relational strategies in, in the aggregate contributed to a culture that yields multiple outcomes that help support positive development. And that this culture was really built on top of respect. 
and bi-directional bi respect, whereby the staff and youth are respecting each other. That's really nurtured and then contributes to the youth's overall sense of self. And if you think back to what I saw in the second study I talked about, where youth were then using the words respectful to describe themselves, right? So they were picking that up and taking it in as part of their own identities. So I'm gonna sort of bring it all together through the story of um, a boy named Lorenzo. And he really, his story encapsulates a lot of these ideas. Lorenzo was a 17-year-old African-American male. Um, I should also note, I don't, whether you've noticed this or not, the quotes when I describe kids, I go back and forth between African-American and black. It's because I use whatever words they use. So if a, if a youth, when I ask them to define themselves, use black, I define them as black. If they used African-American, I define them as African-American. So that's why I switch back and forth. Um, so Lorenzo was a 17-year-old African-American male. He had been a member at the East Side Boys and Girls Club for four years. And he um, had a very close relationship with Charles, who was a staff person, also a very well-loved. He was sort of the male equivalent of Cheryl. He coached a lot of the boys' teams and had some really positive relationships with the kids. Um, Lorenzo also began to coach the younger boys' basketball team, and that's something that I'm going to talk about as being really important to him. So I'm going to give you a little physical description of Lorenzo so you can sort of picture him. So Lorenzo was dark-skinned, broad and tall. He had corn-rowned hair that sort of hung down to the bottom of his neck. He usually was wearing t-shirts and loose pants or athletic clothes. Um, he tended to have a pretty serious facial expression. And he had a small tattoo that would sort of peek out from the blue sweatband that was always around his wrist. He was in the 12th grade at the time that I interviewed him. And he was living with his aunt and her children in the housing project near the club. So he had moved in with them a few years before that at his mother's request. And he had actually taken care of his younger siblings for a while. His mother had disappeared for a while. He took care of his family when he was, let's see, that had been about, I guess when he was about 12 or 13. And then he came and moved in with his aunt. Um, so he tended to appear somewhat aloof to outsiders. He did have this sort of serious expression on his face. But he really clearly enjoyed playing the clown to younger club members. And he would sort of really ham it up with the younger kids. Um, and although he tended to sort of look like he was feigning indifference, he would always break into a smile when something would really strike him as funny. And he had this sort of tough demeanor, but um, I interviewed him twice, and he was in some of the focus groups I conducted. And he always seemed to be quite open and forthcoming in the interviews in the focus groups. Um, he was really thoughtful and spoke a lot about responsibility and respect. This was a real theme in his, in his sort of narrative about himself. Um, and he talked a lot about being a role model for younger kids at the club. And this was something that was really important to him. So at Eastside, he really developed relationships that influenced his sense of self. I mean, when he talked about himself and his participation in Eastside, he was constantly referring to Charles and to the younger kids. So he really didn't feel that the adults at school or in his, in his family had these same kinds of relationships with him. This was really unique for him in his particular life. So to sort of give an example of that, um, when he describes himself, he describes himself as nice, caring, respectful, honest, smart, very talented. Respectful is the most important. I like to treat others as others will treat me. I'm very responsible. So he really constructed himself as someone with connections to other people. And he prided himself on being respectful and responsible. But you can see he's also proud of his individual talents, right? He says that I'm smart, I'm talented. And he was very proud. He was a really star basketball player at the club, and he was very proud of that as well. So his story really demonstrates how an after-school program can serve as a site for the development of relationships that contribute to a real positive sense of self. Um, he says that playing basketball at the club is one of the things that showed him he was talented and that he has what it takes to succeed. At the same time, you can see he says, I never thought kids would look up to someone like me. And that was directly because he was serving as a coach to the younger kids and began to see himself as a role model for these younger kids at the club and saw that as important. So the most common place to find Lorenzo was in the club's gym. So at night, he would often just play ball with his peers, with the other teenage boys. But in the afternoon, he would also be there. So he would show up when the club was open in the afternoon for the younger kids, and he would 
be in there with Charles, and he would help Charles coach the younger kids. And sort of this combination of his love of basketball and having that activity available, and his close relationship with Charles gave him a real distinct position in the club. So it was really the relationships with adult staff and the relationships with youth that were important to Lorenzo and to his sense of self. So he credits the staff at East Side for encouraging him and telling him that whatever I feel, I'm very talented and to stick with it, not to accept anything but success. And he feels that because he has been at the Boys and Girls Club, he can set goals and strive to reach them. So he said to me in an interview, volunteering with the kids at the club influenced what I want to be in the future, to reach out to people and see different prospects of how people see life. Charles has been like a father to me. He talks to me, he cheers me up. At the same time, we have fun. He taught me everything I know about basketball. The club teaches me, I know kids look up to me, and I like to set a positive vibe for them. If I hadn't come to the club, I feel I wouldn't be open and people wouldn't understand how I feel. So Lorenzo thinks that the club is an important place because it's an alternative to the streets, but beyond being a safe haven, Eastside really provided specific supports for Lorenzo's developmental needs. It gave him adult support that he was not getting in other aspects of his home, I mean, sorry, of his life, and it gave him a sense to experience himself as a contributing adult-like figure. He got to sort of be a role model to younger kids, and he wasn't doing that well in school. The truth is, Lorenzo dropped in and out of school. And the staff at the Boys and Girls Club really worked to keep him in school, but he was not doing that well academically. And despite that, he could really see himself as being talented in another area and having a contributing role that was really valued at Eastside. I mean, the staff members saw him as being a really positive vibe in the gym and really being able to work well with kids and were encouraging him in that. So it really gave him a possible future self for himself. So given the significance that he places on his relationships with others, um, the club really served as a key site in helping Lorenzo develop and maintain his positive self-concept. So actually, I think I'm going to skip over the next two slides in the interest of time, although we can go back to these later if anyone is interested in them, but I tried to just, and they're also incredibly hard to read because they're way too small, so I apologize. But um, these are just examples of observations I did of Lorenzo. In this case, he's coaching the boys, and it really shows how Lorenzo was a real good basketball player, and he could play on par with his peers, but when he played with the kids, he tailored his playing. So he would joke around with them, he made sure the younger kids got the ball, and he was really good at that. Um, and then this idea that I mentioned before of tri-level role modeling that I'm going to sort of sum up in a minute. This was a game where Lorenzo and Charles were both there and they were there with the younger kids. And so you got to see Lorenzo hit a home run. He looks at Charles, who's his role model. Charles sort of smiles at him and he gets encouragement from Charles. And then Lorenzo is playing with the younger kids. And so this really highlights what I see as what I call this tri-level role modeling, right? Where you have this adult staff member, then you have an older teen, and then you have younger members. And so while Charles is serving as a role model for Lorenzo, Lorenzo sees that he can also be a role model for younger kids, right? So Lorenzo actually said, I feel that when I'm here, I got to like act like a role model because I know the staff, they probably expect more of me because I've been here so long and they work with me for so long. So I just try to, you know what I'm saying, be a good example for the little kids and all of that. So one of the ways in which this Boys and Girls Club really allowed youth to develop new roles for themselves as the, at the club as they, grew, as they grew older was by providing them with opportunities for this idea of tri-level role modeling. So being able to model oneself on an adult as an individual achiever and as an example to others, I saw as a really unique aspect of these uh, Boys and Girls Clubs and other after-school programs. So teenagers are simultaneously receiving the needed support from adults while also serving as role models to these younger kids. So the relationships help not only to solidify a place for Lorenzo at Eastside, but also influenced his overall sense of himself. So other kids also talked about this. Um, 
there were a number of kids who talked about seeing themselves as being responsible for modeling positive behavior to younger kids at the club and talked about how that influenced their own behavior and made change the way that they saw themselves. So Kelly, who you saw quoted earlier, who was a 16-year-old male, um, he said, at the Boys and Girls Club, it's the place I can go back and be a kid again. It's the place where you don't got to carry all that. But sometimes it's the opposite, because you got to take on more. Because it's like people expect more of you sometimes. It's like, why are you doing that? Why are you acting immature like a little kid? People expect you to be more, to set an example for the younger kids. So that kind of contact really allows teenagers a special opportunity, a developmental opportunity, that meets their needs for support while demonstrating their own independence, that, again, that idea of balancing autonomy and support, and their value as responsible people in their own right. And it also gave them a place in the club that changed according to their chronological age. So there was a girl who, because I was there for four years, I actually saw some of these kids really grow up. And I remember at one point sitting and talking to a girl who three years later became one of my interview participants. And at the time that I was sitting there talking to her, she was I think about 12. And I said to her, so do you think you're gonna keep coming to the Boys and Girls Club as you get older? And she said, oh, yeah, yeah, because see, and she pointed down the hall where at the front desk there was an older teenage girl who was, I think, 16 or 17, who was working at the front desk as a junior staff person. And so she said, well, yeah, I'll keep coming here because, you know, like, she, I, I can work at the club like she is. Three years later, when I was interviewing this girl for the study, she was working at the front desk of the club. I mean, it's sort of exactly what she sort of saw that she could have that, that the club would expand to meet her where she was, right? So kids had, the younger kids had these adult role models, models of who they could be down the road in the future as adults, but they also had teenage role models, so models of who they could be and where they could fit into the club in just a couple of years. And this process of tri-level role modeling really grants youth respect as contributing members of the community and as individuals with an important role within the group. But to achieve that status, the youth really had to demonstrate respect towards the staff and the members and a level of personal responsibility that they were also accorded by the staff. So I think that being able to model oneself on adults as individual achievers, as an example to others, and as a role model to younger kids is a very unique aspect of the club. So there are not a lot of uh, spaces these days in kids' lives where they come into contact with kids older and younger than with them. We live in a pretty age-segregated society. Schools are very segregated. In the family, obviously, you have that opportunity, but it's really with your own family members. And so after school programs, I think, offer a really unique opportunity to cultivate these kinds of opportunities for kids. And it really, I think, meets teenagers' developmental needs and does that in a very specific way. So really briefly, I'm going to just allude to this in passing before I close. Um, the work I'm doing now that's sort of building on this, I'm doing some work on a program called the Young Women Leaders Program, um, which is a combined group and one-on-one -on -one mentoring program for middle school girls. Um, it has a structured curriculum that was created by my colleague Wink Winks Lawrence at the University of Virginia and is focused on this, these ideas of competence, connection, and autonomy. So I have a project going on right now where we're really looking at what happens in these mentoring groups and looking at the relationships between the mentors and youth, but also between the girls in the group to see how that works. And um, I will be focusing on developing the peer mentoring aspect of this and thinking about how we can build um, curriculums that take better advantage of this idea of supporting teenagers and being role models to younger kids. And that's some of the research I am working on now. So in closing, um, I think and I hope that I've at least started to convince you, if you weren't already convinced, that relationships are particularly key to adolescent development for both boys and girls. And that after school programs are really unique settings for offering multi-level relationships to kids so that they have adult youth relationships and there are youth youth relationships. And that really successful programs can provide the infrastructure and support for cultivating both of those. I see these relationships as meeting key adolescent developmental needs for support, for autonomy, 
for modeling future impossible selves, for seeing who you may be, for giving kids a sense of validation, individual validation, and for providing a sense of belonging to community. I think that it's important for organizations to help provide staff with the opportunity to develop relationships with youth. I know that there's a lot of pressure also to move towards structured programming more and more, and sometimes that can sort of not leave a lot of room and time for relationship building. And so I think that it can be really important to figure out ways to give that time and space for relationship building. Um, this idea of respect, really key. I don't know how you train people in that, but, um, but I certainly think it's important to cultivate. Providing opportunities for youth to take on leadership roles in the organization. Um, and building support for this idea of tri-level role modeling, really providing opportunities and structure for having teens work with younger kids, again, under the supervision of adult staff and with some kinds of training, but giving those kinds of opportunities um, that really help meet kids' needs and I think help engage them in the club and help support their overall development. And I will close there.